just curious, like what are some of those materials related challenges that you're facing in this project? I'm sure, you know, with this kind of innovation, there's going to be kind of regulatory concerns as well. But I just wanted to focus on the materials challenges that you're facing in this kind of ongoing project. Got it. So one thing that's unique to TerraPower is that we are developing our own custom, one at least one custom alloy to work on for this project. I can't speak too much about it except what's maybe publicly available that you can look up, but there are there is that aspect that I get to work on and that I come that leads to a lot of different test programs to develop uh, that material for the unique uh, environment that we'll be putting it in. Uh, a lot of other parts of nuclear are actually Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome back to the It's a Material World podcast. I'm your host, Puneet, and I have my co-host, David, alongside me. So, David, what, what's new in, in your world? Yeah, it's finally been more than just a day <laughs> since we've recorded one of these. Yeah. <laughs> so, unfortunately, it's still been pretty boring. Okay. I think much has changed. I did finally get to stay in California for a bit longer after traveling so much, but I think that I'm going to start traveling again, so it <laughs> doesn't, doesn't last too long, but no. Traveling for else. work or for for personal? Well, both. For, for Thanksgiving coming up and uh, Christmas coming up, I'll, I'll be traveling back home. Uh, and then also for work, I'll be traveling to some other sites. So it'll be a busy travel season, so... I'll try to reach my gold medallion on Delta. That'll be that'll be my goal. <laughs> oh my gosh! I just remembered that like you're going to be in North Carolina for in December, right? To yeah. to see your family. So we'll get to see each other for the first time since what is it, Barcelona? <laughs> yeah, yeah, almost a year and a half then. Yeah, yeah. Was, so that's cool. That's cool. But yeah, nothing nothing super new on my end. Just really finally settling into Chicago after also you know a lot of lot of travel. So. Yeah, it's it's been really fun and really loving the location and everything like that. So yeah, let's just kind of get into the episode. We we talk about a multitude of things. I think one key topic is really just data management and how data factors into material science innovations. And our guest, another David, David Pham, <laughs> talks about the integration of data management and the importance of it with relations to uh, the field of nuclear energy, which is something that we've we've covered a few times in, in previous episodes, but not really like this in terms of the integration between the two. So, David, I know you have had previous experience in data science. You recognize the importance of it for sure. Just wanted to get your thoughts on key emphasis and things to look out for in the episode. Yeah, I think that especially with my current job as well, the emphasis on physics-based models that lead to more numerical based models, such as like machine learning or different types of regressions is very important. And so really the takeaway is that you can have more complex models, but any complex model first is a good physical model. So you first identify your system, you identify what you're trying to model, and then you identify the physical properties. And then you conduct a design of experiments to be able to find the emphasis or the coefficients for each of these properties and then you can make a good model and so i think david the other david talked a lot about how you have to have a good physical model especially for explaining how this makes sense to other people and then you can go to the empirical model to work on more of the linear trends and how the data will fit in a more general sense but i think that that is what i think is one of the most important parts is just you have to make a good physical model to make a good, like more advanced complex model uh, or else you'll be focusing on the wrong attributes at first. Yeah, for sure. That's a, that's a good point to make. I think one thing that David went into in, in the episode was also like the material selection and um, the process to, to go about that and how that's also evolved um, over time. You know, I know we, we talked about it a little in the episode Ashby charts are kind of the first thing that comes to mind when you think of the classes that you take with related related to material selection. But he kind of went into how his approach involved the design of experiments, DOE, and then feeding that data into a ML model. So it kind of just shows the evolution of the fields and how we as you know early career professionals as students kind of need to develop these additional skill sets beyond just 
you know, basic data analysis to really kind of stand out in the field nowadays. So he shares a lot of really vital advice. He has the background in material science, of course, and I think it's just a super crucial episode to listen into. We talk about a lot. We hear a lot of his insights and experiences. So without further ado, let's get into the episode. All right. Hello, everyone. For today's episode, I'm glad to introduce another David, David Femme, a senior materials engineer at Terra Power, which is a company centered around nuclear energy. David earned his bachelor's in material science and nanoengineering from Rice in 2018, after which he began his career in engineering rotational leadership program at Baker Hughes in an oil and gas technology based company, where he later became a metallurgical engineer. He then shifted to his current work at Terra Power, focusing on maintaining nuclear material databases of various materials and material properties. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Glad to be here. So let's just get started by breaking down what your current role entails. So can you just kind of give you know a high level overview of, of just the nuclear energy field and in particular kind of how your data-driven approach helps uh, contribute to the field's goals and, you know, how your background in material science kind of plays a role in all of that. Yeah, sure, Punis. A lot of people I talked to, you know, recently with saying I'm in nuclear, I usually relate my work to something they saw on social media like Oppenheimer or Chernobyl, right? <laughs> so I like to, you know, debunk some nuclear myths when I'm first talking to people and hopefully audiences, you know, full of aspiring engineers and materials engineers that might already have a little sense of what nuclear is, but Sometimes I just like to lead in with it's it's just steel and water at, at its core, and it's a little more than that. <laughs> so um, nuclear overall, like I, like I said, it's just using heat to generate steam, which drives a steam turbine that's connected to a generator, right? So the heat comes from nuclear fission, yes, like the splitting of an atom that heats the reactor coolant. Um, the, re the coolant transfers heat to a steam generator, and bang, you've got vapor or steam that can drive your turbine and generate electricity. That's the general gist of things, and I apologize if everyone already knew that, but like I said, I had to explain it to a good number of people, and a lot of people have a lot of nuclear misconceptions, so I thought I'd lead in uh, a little bit with you know what nuclear is. And I always tell people, if you just rebranded nuclear as an advanced steam generator or an advanced steam energy generator, that might you know bring a different connotation to people's heads. So my current team is the data management team in the organization's materials team. Uh, I was the first team member working on this project that we inherited, which was an in-house database of material properties that's intended to be provided across an entire organization. So if you can imagine TerraPower, my company, a small was started as a small re research and development organization, and we, we didn't have a reason to license an expensive solution for materials data management like Granta or one of the other well-known materials database solutions out there. So TerraPower developed its own solution for materials database to provide information to our internal reactor modeling software, which is Python-based and actually recently open-sourced. You can look up the code that it's called, called ARMY, or the Advanced Reactor Modeling Interface. We've got our own GitHub repository and everything. And nowadays, my team provides data across all of our engineering teams, so not just in Python to the Advanced Modeling a reactor modeling interface, but also to design engineers across all different teams. So this is especially important uh, in a growing nuclear company because the industry is so heavily regulated. So I was in oil and gas before, also a pretty heavily regulated industry, you know, based on all of the accidents that happened in recent years. And I, I know probably a lot of our listeners are interested in joining other industries that are also pretty heavily regulated. But trust me when I say that nuclear is on another level of regulation <laughs> of all the controversy and you know historical accidents that you know reach major uh, incident level so with that in mind our company's biggest concern is getting audited and not concerned because it's gonna, it's going to happen eventually that we'll get audited the us has a program called the nuclear regulatory committee or the nrc and they'll audit any aspiring nuclear project before licensing so it's expected that they'll be able to trace the source of the inputs of all of our design calculations and of course, so material properties are one of those biggest inputs. So no matter if our design teams are using like SolidWorks or ANSYS or Mastran or Remap or Alice Dyna, you name your design software, everyone has to prove that their material properties are coming from the same validated source or that they've done their own independent verification that their properties they're using are you know, applicable to their design. 
So think of it like, I don't know, signing the honor pledge in a group project, but the TA is actually reviewing all your work to make sure that your work lines up. And maybe that's a bad example because you're not supposed to copy each other in the honor pledge. But in this <laughs> sense, you are, you're all supposed to be doing the same work. I'm just very curious. So when you're talking generally about these material properties, what material properties are you specifically looking at? And then what type of data are you collecting? Do you expect the material properties to change over the lifetime of a nuclear reactor? Or are you more considering the safety factors of this is how strong it has to be? Like what type of data are we talking about here? All of the above. So I think you've, you've, you've nailed the challenge for especially a new reactor design, <laughs> but the material properties we're looking for in general are mechanical properties are the most straightforward thing to say, you know, hardness, tensile strength, elongation, all of the standard mechanical properties that a design engineer might want to use to create a prototype or an assembly. But the properties are definitely functions of things that are unique to the nuclear field. So when I was in oil and gas, for example, we had to consider environmental things for H2S, for, for cracking. We had to consider different water salinity, things like that, that might affect corrosion rate. And in nuclear here, we still have things that are a function of temperature. So you have things that are outside of the core that will still be exposed to different temperature and different conditions over a certain amount of time. So you, like you said, you'll have to figure out how those high temperature conditions affect your mechanical properties, degrade your mechanical properties over time. But you also have really unique situations inside the core. So until I joined the nuclear industry, I had never thought that you could get a, a mechanical property as a function of displacements per atom, right? That's not something you probably run into in college, but you get these unique independent variables that uh, arise because of the nuclear conditions that you're in, and those will also affect your mechanical properties over time. So not only is my team uh, working on collecting material data through either long-term test programs or literature or partners or suppliers experience, but we're also working with our sister team on the materials team to do material surveillance. And that involves putting test samples into the reactor and pulling and planning to pull them out at a certain amount of time to ensure that our models are matching what actually happens. So it's a whole series of different ways to monitor materials over time in the reactor. But generally speaking, mechanical properties, chemical properties, those are your normal things that your team's gonna be looking at. So David, what does like in when you do get audited, what I know you mentioned kind of maybe like that traceability to everything, right? But are right. they looking at like the the calculations or anything like with more scrutiny in terms of, you know, like are they doing those engineering type calculations and like kind of basically like double checking your work in terms of that that safety factor and things like that? Like what is the extent that you need to have that traceability and, you know, as well as kind of that engineering confirmation in the materials and everything like that. I'm just curious. It's a good question. And honestly, I'm not that well suited to answer it because it's my first time going through one of these nuclear audits. I, from my understanding and the listening uh, of all of our mentors and people that have gone through the experience before or submitted things potentially to the NRC before, it is a quite a scrutinous process. They will go through and find the source of several of your calculations. Our internal process involves, you know, doing IDV of each other's calculations. So that amount, that only goes to serve that later on somebody will be performing those calculations and verifying that again. And historically, before let's say the benefit of having uh, a way to share documents electronically, it was well known that nuclear licensing documents would take. Not they would measure the amount of documents they sent to the nuclear regulatory committee in train loads, not just like carts or anything, but it was literally train loads of paper that they would send over. So it was a long process, obviously takes months to review and to recreate some of those calculations, but it's assumed that we proceed with the assumption that somebody will be going through and actually performing those calculations again. I'm interested because you're talking about these calculations. For all the calculations that you do, are they all physics-based models or can you use some more numerical models to kind of fit other data? Uh, I guess when you look at these regulators, do they need to be explained in a physics way or just empirical data? You can look over historical like amounts of data and be like, okay, like this is how we came up to the data. Like we see the trend, we think we're confident that it will continue instead of like physical, like we've calculated how the the atoms will move. This is what we think will continue to happen. 
It's a combination of both. We definitely have nuclear engineers and physicists that are creating physics-based models. Often we like to have our physics-based models backed by empirical data, which is part of that surveillance program that I mentioned earlier. So obviously we can't have the results of a surveillance program before our reactor is actually operational, but certainly we can rely on similar conditions that were reported in literature or shared by our partners that might be able to have an analogous, analogous environment to what we might operate in. So I'd like to think it's a little bit of both. Um, so certainly calculations create some kind of equation that people can use to model physical phenomena as a function of an independent variable like temperature. And we have to use data to create those equations. Um, but usually they're based on or accompanied by a constitutive model that may be created in a computational materials program or a physics-based software that is giving us that solution. So always like a combination of both, but it's, it's, it depends how much of data we have available for a given property. Makes sense. Maybe let's move to the main project that you work on, which is the Natrium project. Could you describe how this project is different from other types of nuclear energy or power plants? Of course. So my company's project, Natrium, is classified as one of the generation four nuclear reactors. So that's a series of nuclear technologies selected internationally to go through research and development. Uh, I could probably give another hour of a presentation about the other types of generation four nuclear reactors or even what generation uh, was before this one, because we're still technically doing research and development of generation three nuclear reactors, but they're all generation four reactors are all still in the research phase as well. And a couple of examples of those are concepts that were considered revolutionary at the time of the creation of the generation four international forum. So they had things like the gas cooled reactor, the lead cooled fast reactor, the molten salt reactor, all different capacities and fuel types and systems that are intended to be safer than the previous generation so that people would be more, I guess, comfortable with the idea of nuclear. So my project, TerraPower's project, Natrium, is a type of sodium cooled fast reactor. So it uses liquid molten sodium as the reactor coolant and because of the low pressure, high thermal capacity. And the goal of our reactor is to create about 345 megawatts electric of energy with an ability to boost up to 500,000-ish megawatts energy, which powers a couple hundred thousand homes. So we're trying to prove this sodium fast reactor works at a retiring coal facility in Wyoming for the first demo facility, and then we'll see where it goes from there. So there's other unique innovation in the project too. The energy generation part is separate from, just separate enough from where the nuclear reaction takes place that it's considered different from a regulatory standpoint. So there's some other innovation that we're adding into the design as well, but the general core concept is the sodium fast reactor. That's really fascinating. I'm just curious, like what are some of those materials related challenges that you're facing in this project? I'm sure, you know, with this kind of innovation, there's going to be kind of regulatory concerns as well, but I just wanted to focus on the materials challenges that you're facing in this kind of ongoing project. Got it. So one thing that's unique to TerraPower is that we are developing our own custom one, at least one custom alloy to work on for this project. I can't speak too much about it, except what's maybe publicly available that you can look up, but there are, there is that aspect that I get to work on and that, that leads to a lot of different test programs to develop uh, that material for the unique uh, environment that we'll be putting it in. Uh, a lot of other parts of nuclear are actually pretty well understood from a materials perspective, at least there's entire ASME, American Society of Mechanical Engineers codes that are designed for nuclear reactors at high temperature uh, performance of materials. So a lot of materials that are planned to be used are off the shelf ASME materials in some way, shape or form. And we still have to figure out, you know, which steels are applicable for our environment and things like that. But we have some historical data to draw on for the creation of those parts that aren't as uh, exposed to high nuclear radiation, let's say. So things that are just working outside the core at high temperature are very likely to be based off of other people's experience, which is well understood in ASME code. And so procurement of material is always a really big deal for at least, especially nowadays with supply chain issues for, for especially for creating a demo nuclear reactor. And so we try to get as much as our material design as we can to make sure that it is procurable. And that is always a challenge for a materials engineer to work through the supply chain, because even as we're creating and developing this new alloy, we have to figure out who's willing to make it in quantities that aren't, you know, as much as if you're in aerospace or in oil and gas buying long pipes of metal, 
right? Because we're producing a demo facility that's on the scale of tons of metal, not hundreds of tons of metal. And when you're trying to get a, like a mill run of metal, it's hard to be able to do that without having a big quantity. So if we're trying to create a custom alloy, which we are, to treat the, to work in our reactor, then it's uh, a challenge in the supply chain. So we, we try to do as much off the shelf as we can. So your reactor is using sodium, which is roughly the same melting temperature as water. I guess, why sodium? The main reason for sodium is because it's generally a safer coolant than water and also a more efficient coolant. So there's a combination of more operating at a lower pressure in case of a leak. There's, there's the higher thermal capacity, so it can be a more efficient transfer of heat to the eventual energy generation part, which is still fundamentally heating water to create steam. So those are a couple, a couple of reasons. So kind of going off that material selection and material property databases that you kind of put together, they, they work directly hand in hand. So I was wondering if you can maybe share any case studies that are particularly interesting where material selection was potentially a particularly difficult task and what you did to kind of solve that issue and kind of overcome that challenge? Yeah, so this is a really interesting question because material selection might be one of those classes that you take in college to get like a broad sense of what exactly goes into it. I don't know if you guys took material selection in university, but I still remember looking at Ashby diagrams of materials. Yep. So you have maybe, you know, density X axis, strength Y axis, and it shows off a whole bunch of materials, right? But within each family of those materials, you still have so many choices within them, right? You have metals and plastics and things, but you still have like hundreds of metals you can select within the metal sphere, and each of them have a different use case in certain environments. And then you have to worry, like I said earlier, when you're thinking about supply chain, how you're actually going to make that part out of the material. You have to think, like, is this machinable? Is this actually able to be procured in the product form that I'm looking for? And then it becomes a whole supply chain and procurement problem on top of an engineering problem. So all of that to say is that materials databases can take a lot of forms, right? It's very unlikely in a company that you're going to have hundreds of thousands of test data points for one material, unless you have like a really active quality control department that's been in manufacturing, that's been around for many years, or if you're working for a test lab, in which case you're mostly testing for other people. So if you're not in one of those situations, it's unlikely that you're going to have a lot of raw data available. But you'll find that materials data comes in other forms. Just as often, you'll find that materials comes in the form of failure analysis reports. You'll find that they'll come even from reports from your operations team that you might have to read through in order to find common causes of why a material was chosen over another or what the historical basis is. And all of that is informing your material selection and also are the foundation for how you can improve material selection moving forward. Because in an ideal world, your mechanical engineers and your designers will get your materials guys involved early in the preliminary design process, but it's just as likely that you'll be involved in the conversation by the time the part has already failed and you'll have to recommend a new material after something went wrong, right? So it depends all when you get involved in the process, but that all means that the, the sources of data you'll be looking at are going to look different, not just like tensile data or test data, but it's going to look like perhaps a more qualitative response. Uh, and so I've, and to answer your question, I've been lucky enough to have the opportunity to develop a material and that was working when I was working on dissolvable materials in oil and gas. So in that situation, we had a number of options for materials and also for the manufacturing of these alloys. And I was able to create a design of experiments that I used to feed into a machine learning model that informed our operations team about the best alloy to use in a specific environment that would affect their rate of corrosion. And so that was a really unique project because you're, I was looking for something to actually corrode and disappear, unlike most people are trying to prevent corrosion or keep their uh, shape in one piece, right? So that was, that was an interesting challenge because it was me giving a machine learning model to a bunch of variables that needed to be measured out in the field, like water pH and conductivity and things like that. And it would tell us what alloy to pick, recommend for a certain situation. So definitely that was a long running project. That was a very interesting one, a very unique one. I kind of want to highlight that and maybe go over it in how, how much ever detail you can, because I know, you know, companies, you don't want to share too many right. secrets, but I think that this is something that 
I could see material scientists in the future, like needing both of those skill sets um, to really kind of make an impact and, and differentiate themselves um, within their companies and within kind of uh, different industries. Basically, you mentioned DOE, right, design of experiments and feeding kind of that data into a machine learning model. So kind of, can you go over how those two kind of skill sets and methods were integrated and maybe also like how you learned it if you know if you have any recommendations for students to kind of develop that kind of experience and and have that because i think again that would be crucial for material scientists the next generation in any any industry right and i definitely will always say that data analytics and data science are fundamental for all future of any type of engineering so i'll That'll be a probably theme in my in my chat, but in terms of design of experiments, uh, I will admit that I learned design of experiments mostly while on, doing on the job training. Uh, I was lucky enough to work with some brilliant PhDs during my time in oil and gas that were able to uh, teach me the different methodology of both design of experiments and the software used to create both full factorial, partial factorial, other types of design of experiments uh, you might think of. And then review, of course, the test plan and everything. So we had a lot of we had multiple variables, a bunch of different samples, a bunch of a lot of different things to test. And the way that we created that design of experiments was definitely based in science, right? So earlier, other David OG asked me what what it took to to have like a physics based model versus empirical data. So what informed our design of experiments are definitely our fundamental understanding of what variables led to this process, which is the corrosion or dissolvability of our alloys. So going through that, creating that design of experiments based on, we use software, but there's also fundamental principles behind it. And then the data on my side, I taught myself machine learning through Udemy when I first actually started working, again, kind of on the job training, but I worked with a mentor who was an experienced data scientist at the time. I actually took Udemy courses in the evenings to improve my understanding because it was Lucky enough, when I was on my first rotation of my rotational development program that they got my resume confused with somebody else's. And instead of onboarding as a material scientist, I onboarded as a data scientist. So, so my, no. my first rotation, I was a data engineer and I, I, did, I made machine learning models on real-time data that came from our downhole sensors to try and find, let's say, situations or flag events that would happen to our downhole technologies. So I did that for six months and that's kind of, that kind of led into my whole interest of how data science blends with our uh, data that we get from materials work and how it can help inform better decisions. So long way around to say that the machine learning experience I had came from kind of an accident, but I try to apply it to as many different fundamental engineering processes and techniques that I can now. And so this was actually a really good opportunity to use that data from the design of experiments to inform a solution um, through using a machine learning model um, that because because of the way that we implemented it, which was uh, creating a tool that could be sent out to our field engineers and the machine learning model was kind of put into a black box in a way so they wouldn't understand what's going on in the background. And that was good for our proprietary purposes, but it would spit out a solution that they would be using to inform both the customers and their reports in order to make sure that people understood why we selected the material that we did. Wow, that's awesome. I think one question I have for you is, like you said, there's one avenue, which is you do the design of experiments, you conduct the experiments, you get the data, and you feed into a model that you make. But another avenue is to use other publicly available data. And that's kind of Absolutely. the goal of like your project is to like create this open repository. For that, I think that depending on like how you do the experiment, the conditions you do the experiment, how can you trust other people's data that you don't get? How, how do you guys filter and clean that? Absolutely. And just as a quick correction of understanding, like definitely our materials data, at least the Terra Power, is still kept proprietary. So oh. that is one thing that the reactor modeling interface, ARMY, is open source, but it's kind of a foundation of nuclear engineering that could be used for other nuclear reactor design. But definitely the materials data, we still keep proprietary. So that's one part of the whole system that is still a lot of IP around that, especially like test data and things, right? All, a lot of companies keep their test data close to heart. 
But definitely, we still try to identify where other academic literature and published papers might have data available that's analogous to our environment and might be able to be used to inform our design decisions. So it is a challenge. And there, it's often, how do I say, when we look through literature, we usually consider there's different pedigrees of information available out there. Probably the highest pedigree that anyone might find either in the nuclear industry or even other industries is the ASME code, American Society of Mechanical Engineers, and mostly because you have even material that's trademarked to ASME, right? That's certified to meet ASME requirements. Do you have other well-known sources of data that are industry specific? So when I was in oil and gas, we had API, we had different international standards that might be relevant to our design and nuclear also has some historical basis of documents that are used to inform nuclear reactor design as well. One older one that's no longer maintained, for example, is the Nuclear System Materials Handbook. And then kind of on the bottom of the totem pole, you have academic literature and published papers. And those are indeed, like you said, very hard to verify and identify the recreatability of those papers, right? You know, a lot of times you have results documented and the physics are very well documented and the science is very well documented, but you might be missing some fundamental information that something like, you know, was your tensile test calibrated correctly? Nobody's gonna put that in the research paper because it doesn't sound interesting, right? <laughs> so, or like even which test lab did you perform it at? A lot of people will leave that information out because for, well, A, it's not interesting to read and B, Maybe they just don't want to share because of the way that they're setting up their testing with an external laboratory or they're doing it themselves. <laughs> so that I would definitely say that is one of the harder parts of using external resources and why so many companies keep their material property data so close to hand because they know the way that they did it and they have the correct documentation. But part of being able to vet external data is a combination of engineering judgment kind of understand, you know, is this how peer reviewed is it? Does this check out from my engineering judgment perspective? And then also to corroborate it with other data. That's one of the common accepted methods, even by ASME NQA1, which is a quality program to be able to use different sets of data together is by comparing and contrasting it against equivalent conditions that are found in another paper. So if multiple people are able to defend the replicability of material property, then generally considered to be a better source. Awesome. Well, I guess that that makes total sense why you guys would keep it so close. And so maybe another question would be, I know there's industry requirements for data management. And so I know that first, you guys are very protective over the data, but also we need to keep a record of how you got to the conclusion to be able to back up your claims. So since this is something that most people don't work with, can you describe what these standards are and then maybe some pros and cons about them? Yeah, I think a lot of people might not have to directly work with data management, but most industries have the same idea of quality management systems. And so for students, I guess it's kind of like being asked to show your work and cite your references, but take it to the next level. So imagine having to do that in like five years or 10 years when somebody's questioning your PhD defense, right? So for quality standards, the they generally help everyone understand the baseline of what they're doing. And so the pro there is that you, you can read a quality, an industry standard of a quality document, and you'll have a baseline procedure of data quality and data management. So you'll understand what your company needs to do, um, same as kind of following the formula from a textbook, if that makes sense. So if uh, fortunately or unfortunately, and I'm gonna put this out as a con, uh, these standards aren't really prescriptive on how you need to execute those requirements. So for example, I'm going to throw a name out there, but ISO 8000 is a pretty well-known quality management standard. And you, they'll have something there like a requirements for data governance and supporting requirements like data specifications, records of nonconformities, roles and responsibilities for data management across an organization, things like that. But actually executing those requirements is often up to the company or the person interpreting the standard. And that means they have to decide which tools might contribute to each aspect. So not only are they documenting in your standard, like write a procedure and word and publish a PDF, but how is that PDF being stored? Which tools are being used to follow these actual requirements of the quality standard? And there is no one size fits all solution. 
one company might host things on the cloud and then you choose your cloud system, you have Azure or AWS or whatever. One company might use SAP because your manufacturing data can feed directly into it and your procurement can pull from it and things like that. And one company, you know, with a low budget solution might just have an internal server full of network drives. So the implementation of the data management is very much up to each company. And of course, some are much more friendly to data, to data than others, to data management, because having to parse PDFs from a network folder that you can only connect to on internal VPN is much more difficult than if you have access to a whole bunch of Excel uh, sheets or if you're even trying to parse text files from GitHub or something. Uh, and so that has layers of ease of access, but maybe all of those would meet the requirements of the quality standard that you follow. So pro is that there is a baseline available for you to understand out there. Con is that the interpretability is often up to the individual and that comes with experience, I think. It's interesting to see how that applies, not even just in the nuclear field, but really all industries, like at my Absolutely. company, it's, it's, you know, we have a whole corporate quality division that's dedicated to exactly what you were talking about, like basically interpreting these ISO standards or, you know, any standard and then figuring out how to translate that. So everyone in the company can follow that, you know, then they create these internal you know, standard operating procedures and work instructions. And then even that can be distilled down to even more detail for how to actually execute on that. So that's just really, really interesting. And I appreciate you kind of uncovering that for us. So just to quickly touch on one thing that you mentioned there, um, procedures are very essential, I think, especially in my in in nuclear industry. And that's one thing I talked about aud audits earlier and how the NRC will go through an audit, but they're generally auditing our procedures, right? Because that's what every engineer is expected to follow when they're executing a plan or creating a report or even documenting data because there are procedures associated with all of that. And coming from another industry that was much, let's say, less procedurally driven, there's often a lot of conversation of how many, how much gets lost in your tribal knowledge when your 50 year in the industry metallurgist retires, you know? So procedures help mitigate some of that, as you can imagine, and developing those procedures is definitely a challenge because not only is it the people that are, you know, creating the procedures, but also the people that are executing them. And then if the procedure is not good, they're going to go out and do their own thing. And then you have all of that loss to loss of history, right? So procedures are definitely important. And so I'm going to leave the audience with that. <laughs> oh, for sure. Yeah. Systems and processes integral for anything really, but and it's interesting too how you essentially like when you especially when you get to a really big company and those procedures, those SPs have to kind of work for a lot of different products and divisions. You have to balance kind of almost being general enough to kind of fit all buckets, but then also being specific enough where you don't leave anything up for like interpretation in a bad way. You know, I, I just feel like it's right. a, a tough balance. I've just been on one end of it where I just read it and I'm like, okay, I think I understand what it means. Let me execute. And then if I have questions, I'll ask our SME. But I wanted to kind of just dive into another challenge with, with relation to data management. And that's kind of the balancing and integration between the digitalization of data with also kind of old methods of data management, you know, like I know even even in our company, like there's there's paper documents that we just kind of send off away. And then if we really need them, then we we call them and, and ask them to bring it back. But what have been the challenges you see in the digitalized edition of data versus kind of that, you know, binders, filing cabinets, et cetera, and going back into the history of it, history of everything, basically. <laughs> no, you just talked about being, have sending out papers uh, to somewhere else and having to recall them. And I've definitely encountered similar situations, but especially when I was in oil and gas, which is an older industry, right? I've, I, I've literally had to sift through a file cabinet in my first years, and there's crazy amounts of data on paper that I'm sure people have entirely forgotten about. So hopefully people are getting better than that. And that's kind of, I guess, part of the question of digitization. So I think data processing is a huge challenge in every field, but especially legacy materials data, because even when you're sifting through that file cabinet, you're really lucky if that's gonna be organized and if that's what you're stuck with or if the reports are even all in the same format, right? So 
even if you have digitized copies of old texts, and I'm going to pull, like I, I mentioned earlier, the Nuclear System Materials Handbook, which is now you know available digitized uh, export control out of the US, but still people have scanned in those pages. It's, like I said, often in a format that makes it really difficult to parse. You might not be able to control F and even search through it. So those are those are the kind of documents that are available, but still difficult to work with, right? And even if your data is perfect, it's unlikely that it has the level of testing documentation that your modern requirements might meet. So earlier, I was talking a little bit about, you know, like tensile test data. You might not know if your auditor asks how the guy who ran the machine was trained and certified to run it, or how your testing machine was calibrated, or is there documentation of room temperature as RT, the same definition as your definition, and does that matter? You know, so all of those things might be questions that you have to answer for your modern audit that aren't documented in your historical data. And that's why, you know, a good test laboratory will have the answer to all those questions nowadays because they're following their ISO standard or they're certified to meet their quality requirements in some way. But like I mentioned earlier, the people reporting those results, whether that's in academic literature or even internal reports, won't have that level of documentation and you'll have to kind of trace all of that back to the source. So that's all a level of difficulty that not only does data have to be digitized, but it has to actually have all of the metadata that you need in order to answer the questions of, is this usable data? And those are all fundamental issues with data management, right? The replicability of older data um, being hard to prove. And so this is an ongoing challenge. Obviously, if your company is designing your own test program, you have to accommodate for all of these factors and make sure that these are all traceable and documented. And it's going to be a working relationship between your materials team and your quality team to ensure that all of those requirements are met. Certainly, a good materials engineer also understands quality and supply chain and procurement and everything, but there are always the different teams that we work with to make sure that we aren't missing anything or anything falls under the gap. Just like in the same way that we don't want our mechanical engineers to go off and choose their own materials and go off their own one, one materials MISNI 201 class, we also don't want to be assuming that we're quality people without that experience. So, Yeah, I think that's super insightful on how you get data, how you build up data, and how you maintain data. So now maybe you have all this data, maybe some advice on how to use it. I think specifically for us as engineers, the most common way we use the data is to visualize trends or key topics or key points that we want to make across whatever we're working on. So do you have any recommendations or tips to how to present data to different audiences now that we have this huge like repository? So the take the one overall takeaway that I'll have is know your audience and I'll kind of go into what that means. So I think the future of data science as a whole is going to need both the technical expertise of materials engineers, domain experts, and then the models that are made on the data science side, whether that's by a data scientist or analyst, or whether your engineer is doing the data science. Um, so from a technical perspective, and again, this all circles back to David's original question of physics-based models or empirical models, but you have to have the ability to reconcile your data with fundamental physics to make your presentation make sense. You know, if your model is telling you that the apple is falling from the tree in April, you've got to have somebody out there that says April is not farming season. It doesn't make any sense, right? <laughs> so, so aside from that, you know, my advice to any data scientists out there or engineers out there is understand how to make a presentation, right? This means that you have to know your audience because there is a time and place to have a wordy, dense slide. And during a presentation to management, I'm going to be honest, that's not usually the right time. So knowing how to separate data, like a lot of data, you have a lot of data and you're going to be making all kinds of different visualizations of it. Some of those belong in a handout. Some of them belong in a post-meeting follow-up. And what you're actually presenting needs to be what actually matters to the people that are listening. So are you trying to sell an idea? Are you trying to present a different solution if your data did not align with your hypothesis? And all so all of these soft skills are kind of crucial in understanding when and where to present your data. And you've got to ensure that it makes sense so that you can present it in a way that it actually matters for your audience. So summarize all that, make sure that you understand who you're talking to, what they actually need from your data, and then present it in a way that fits that entire narrative. Because there are a lot of different ways to present data. 
you know, you can have anything from pie charts, bar charts, histograms, any number of statistical basic graphs you have. You can go steps further. There are people that give TED Talks on presenting data and statistics that have all sorts of crazy different videos or trends of data over time that they show through their presentations. And there's a lot of ways to present data out there. But I think what really matters is how that aligns with the message you're trying to give. Absolutely. So now I want to move on to kind of your vision for this integration of data management, which everybody deals with, as you mentioned, to kind of keep up with the technological innovations that we'll be seeing in the next five to 10 years. How do you imagine and envision that materials specific data management will have to adapt to kind of keep up with the innovations that we're going to see, whether you want to sp speak on the nuclear field in particular, or just, you know, material science in general? Yeah, I think nuclear as a, as a whole will continue to progress in five, 10 years. My project is definitely on, you know, somewhere in that time span <laughs> and the <laughs> perception, you know, the public perception of nuclear will improve. So I think I'll, I'll leave that to the side as we continue to grow in nuclear developments, especially the Gen 4 nuclear reactor designs, et cetera. But for materials data management, I, I have a hope that eventually we'll get to the place where we have some level of automation for data management and data processing for your basic materials test programs. And so in order to kind of produce that data in the right format and be able to give it to your materials engineers in a way that they can use it for data analysis, that's going to be critical. I can definitely see long-term improvements in, for example, how test labs have their layout in terms of, you know, you have, you send them a bar of material or a piece of material, they're going to do the machining of it into a tensile sample and their whole suite of different mechanical test specimens. They're going to go do the testing. A lot of that is a pretty manual process right now. I don't know if who's had the chance to go visit a test lab, but you'll know there's a lot of technicians on hand that make all the magic happen when you just send them a PO and a piece of material, right? Uh, but I used to go uh, witness these tests in person. It was necessary for signing off on them for our third party, third party witnessing requirements. And a lot of those I could see having some level of automation in the future. You know, tensile tests are still hooked up to software that record and manage all the data, but the kind of traceability of everything still is something that's a relatively manual process, at least in the labs that I've gone to. Maybe there's some great impressive labs out there. They're already doing what I'm talking about. <laughs> and I think it's unfortunately a ways away from happening because maybe it's just not as exciting. Like you see these, it's a marginal improvement in how things are done because the lab procedures are already so well-defined that, you know, it's down to potentially human error and training at that point because they've already figured out their workflow and it's a very efficient one. And they're making money. So there's not, I don't know if there's as many room for that level of improvement in automation as there is just improving their test machinery itself. So you can get more accurate test machinery or you can get more efficient with your processes. And I don't know who's really looking at the efficiency as much as they are in like the nice shiny new machine that they might be able to buy for a chemistry analysis or something like that. But that could definitely happen. That's definitely something I'm optimistic for. <laughs> I think data analytics themselves and data storage will always continue to improve. I mean, you've got in the last few years alone, like probably different buzzwords pop up every other month. I think back in the 80s, it used to be like a data warehouse for storing data. In the early 2010s, it was a data lake. And then only a few years ago, I was on another uh, call and I heard the term data lake house being dropped, which is a com combination of a data warehouse and a data lake. It uses cloud storage to store all kinds of data under one architecture, right? And I was like, wow, that's somebody just really coined that. <laughs> Incredible. So, you know, all these methodologies are being developed because the next five, 10 years, we'll always have improvements in CPUs, GPUs, computing power across all different industries. And that really helps power this computational materials and analysis and data science that is everybody is doing. You know, everybody talks about AI recently, and that's only really possible in recent years because of the improvements in the fundamental infrastructure that powers all of that analytics, right? So that will continue to grow. I'm definitely looking forward to seeing how those will grow and be able to process data and how different companies will leverage those tools to be able to make better decisions alongside our fundamental understanding of physics. That's all hopefully in the next five, 10 years, I think. Awesome. That's a lot to get to, <laughs> but <laughs> a lot of people uh, working but, on it. But yeah, maybe to wrap up the conversation today, I think 
We would love more specific advice, especially for those who are just starting their careers or in college or or graduating from high school and get advice about data management side of material science and what you would suggest for them to succeed in the field as they move on with their careers. Absolutely. So data science will be a part of your future for making informed decisions. That is a true for any engineer, I think. And so understanding what that looks like from a learning culture and how the how that works in the back, all the models and mathematics to make it make sense, I think is useful for any engineer. So I mentioned earlier, but interpreting inter- data science requires some fundamental engineering, physics-based models, things like that, and how to apply those decisions is also based in fundamental engineering. But I'd like to tell my mentees that a long time ago, right, the minimum requirement for entering an engineering job was like Microsoft, Excel, and Word. Right now, you can, maybe now it's like v, you can do some VBA or in Excel as well, do some automation there. But I think that goalpost is slowly being moved for people that are high performing or people that are really looking to stand out in, especially in understanding of data science. So not only do you have your basic statistics coursework, but you also want to be able to how to want to be able to understand how to apply those in Python and R and SQL, and having that fundamental understanding of the those data management tools and also their different kind of tools available in the world and able to being able to pick up a new tool are all really vital for your career because er, like earlier I mentioned that the interpretation of quality standards is very dependent on how your company's team executes them so when you go from one company to another or one stage of life to another you're going to be working on you're going to have different tools available to your disposal and being able to adapt to those but also understand why that tool was selected and how that contributes to your data analysis is all fundamentally useful. So yeah, <laughs> really appreciate you sharing that. Like, I think that's, that's so critical. I just wanted to give a generic example of like how that can be used in the field for anybody who is still kind of, I, I guess, kind of finishing up their academic career. But um, one thing is, you know, if you see like a change in performance in the field for, for one of your products, right? Whether good or bad, it would be useful to kind of recognize what maybe triggered that change if it's statistically significant. But there's often, you know, these products, they go through a development cycle or, you know, the the manufacturing cycle, right? And it's oftentimes there's multiple suppliers that you have to deal with, even if you do most of it in-house. So it's very difficult to kind of trace back to it. So, you know, I've just in personal experience, I've seen kind of multiple instances where there's a change and you have to kind of go back and trace like to the batch basically of like, where did that happen? You know, when did it happen? What, what process changes, design changes, et cetera, kind of triggered that change or could have triggered it. And so there's a lot of times where I'm working with our, you know, in-house data scientists to kind of do that batch tracing and, and really figure that out. So that's just one, one generic example, but um, to, to highlight the importance of what you were just talking about. But all in all, just wanted to thank you for joining us today. I really appreciate you sharing your insights and advice and experiences. It was a pleasure having you on the show, David. No, I'm ha- I was happy to be here and have this chat. And I'm looking forward to working with a new generation of materials engineers that are data savvy and able to produce data that we'll all be able to use in the future. Absolutely. As a materials engineer, we can make an impact in nearly every single industry. But with that versatility comes a lot of different options to choose from. So if you have no idea which industry or position is right for you, believe me, you're not alone. I've been there, done that. But just for a moment, imagine narrowing down your ideal role and company by the end of this week. Imagine being able to secure your dream job offer without having to apply to hundreds of job openings. Our online course, MSE Academy, includes video testimonials, resumes, interview prep, and mentorship from materials engineers who have been in your shoes. We also connect our members with companies and industry professionals in our expansive network to help accelerate your job search as much as possible. To learn more and get started, simply click the link in the description below. And if you enroll within the next 24 hours, we'll add three bonus career development resources. I hope to see you there.